This is late winter pruning. Who knew so many people were so excited about this topic? Uh, my name is Darby Love. I'm the Adult Services Librarian at Nanaimo North Branch of Vancouver Island Regional Library. And April Ripley in Souk Branch is uh, here as well, co-hosting with me. And before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the traditional unceded territory of the Snenemu. Um, as we're not under the same roof today, I encourage you to take a moment to think about where you are, and you can put it in the chat if you'd like, or otherwise just think about it. Um, and our heartfelt thanks to the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association for partnering with us on this program. Thank you so much for Deborah and to Richard for being here today to make this program possible. And just a few housekeeping items. So we are recording this session today. No one's image or personal information is in any way going to be captured. Uh, this is purely as a webinar. So that's why I had to ask you if you could hear and see me. <laughs> so please keep using the chat. We'd really like um, to, we like seeing your, your comments and things like that. If you can put your questions in the Q&A. So if you go to the bottom of your screen, second item from the left after participants, it should show up as Q&A or maybe you have something different. If you put your questions in there, just because we have so many people, that'll really help us to be able to make sure we get to the questions. Um, and if you really can't figure that out, you can try in the chat and we'll do our best to find your question. Um, I think that's it. So yeah, uh, Deborah is going to be answering questions at the end of the presentation. She'll be doing a sort of slideshow presentation about some of the theory stuff. And then uh, we're going to go on a field trip for a video, <laughs> which will be awesome. I'm just going to introduce Deborah. Uh, Deborah Gurad is became interested in gardening at an early age from watching her parents, who are both in their 90s and still gardening. In uh, 2019, she was able to fulfill her dream of Master Gardener training and has been a member of the Vancouver Island Master Gardener Association ever since. Her special interests are pruning and vegetable gardening. As a retired teacher who still loves to teach, Deborah really enjoys sharing her gardening knowledge with other gardeners, for which we are very grateful. Thank you, Deborah. I'm going to pass it over to you. Okay, ready to share my screen? Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right, late winter pruning, copyright 2023, Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association and the Vancouver Island Regional Library. This seminar is the property of the Vancouver Island Regional Library and Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association and is intended for education purposes only. Commercial use of all or part of this seminar or its contents is prohibited without express written consent of Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association and the Vancouver Island Regional Library. The information in this seminar is science-based and is accurate to the best of this knowledge. Use of information in this seminar is at the sole discretion, responsibility, and liability of the user. The Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association is a chapter of Ma Master Gardeners Association of British Columbia a, and a member of an international service organization of specially trained volunteer teachers dedicated to stewardship of the environment. Master Gardeners work in partnership with public se sector agencies, garden clubs, nonprofit service organizations, and private private enterprise to teach and promote science-based, sustainable horticultural knowledge and methods. Some images and information are from internet sources. These are labeled or cited, and we thank the persons and companies for their use in this nonprofit educational seminar. <clears throat> Hello, and welcome everyone to the basics of late winter pruning. The art and science of pruning is not something I can teach you in one short hour, so I'm just going to be giving you an outline of tools, kinds of cuts, and the basic steps to prune pretty much anything. There will be many specialized types of pruning that I won't have time to touch on, like fruit trees, pollarding, grapevines, and roses, to name just a few. But my hope is that you come away with a good basic foundation of pruning principles 
as a starting point for your further learning. Let me begin with a quote from the Royal Horticultural Society explaining why we prune. At the simplest level, the purpose of pruning and training is to ensure that plants are as healthy and vigorous as possible, free of structural weakness, and at the least risk of being infected by disease. The effects of expert pruning, however, go beyond this straightforward aim. With additional knowledge of how pruning and training influence the way in which plants grow and perform, the gardener can not only improve their natural appearance, but also enhance ornamental features such as flowers and foliage, increase crops, and create striking plant features and combinations. To put it very simply, we prune plants for their health by removing dead, diseased, and damaged wood, which can all act as pathways for disease to get into the plant. We also prune for aesthetics, including the shape of a plant, as well as to encourage more blooms or interesting foliage. We prune for fruit production, both size and amount of fruit and its accessibility. And we prune to control size. Just a note on that. As master gardeners, we strive always to teach right plant, right place. And I'm always amazed at the people who buy a plant either ignoring its mature size or thinking they will just prune it to keep it the size they want. This sets up an endless battle between them and the genetics of the plant, striving to make itself its inherent size. Much better all the way around to plant with the mature size in mind. <clears throat> when you think about all the plants in the wild that manage to do just fine without human help, however, it becomes clear that plants have no inherent need to be pruned. We prune mostly to meet our needs and desires for plants. In fact, pruning is wounding. So always keep in mind that you should prune only what is necessary. Plants do not heal from pruning, but they do have a rather marvelous mechanism for sealing pruning wounds, which I will explain a bit later. Given that pruning is wounding, it is always better to prune frequently when plants are young and cuts will be small in order to avoid later making big wounds that open the plant to disease. Proper training of a young plant will avoid the need for large renovation pruning cuts later. This tree was very badly pruned and will likely eventually succumb to rot and disease. Most deciduous trees and shrubs are best pruned while they are dormant, but can also take light pruning anytime. There are, however, best times to prune different plants based on the following. Growth habit of the plant. Is it upright? Is it vining? Is it a woody perennial that gets frost damage every winter? Is it a cane grower? What season do, do plants bloom is another factor in when to, to bloom. You don't want to be pruning off the buds in the spring for a plant that's set to bloom like a week later or a month later. Another consideration is type of flowering wood. Does it bloom on new growth, last year's growth, or old wood? To help gardeners know when is the best time to prune, the Royal Horticultural Society has defined 13 pruning groups to which all woody plants that require pruning have been assigned. Each pruning group explains the type of plant assigned to it, the type of pruning best suited for those plants, and the best time of year to do the pruning. It's a simple matter to look up which pruning group pretty much any plant belongs to to get an idea of best pruning practices for that plant. Most plants have a pruning budget, 25 to 30% of the plant, which means don't remove more than that in any one year. Plants rely on their leaves photosynthesizing to make food, so pruning too much removes resources necessary for the plant to maintain itself. Like most generalizations, however, this one is also generally, but not always, true. Different plants can withstand different amounts and kinds of pruning without suffering dieback, water sprouting, or looking bad. Too bad the pruning budget isn't posted on the trees and shrubs. If the pruner overdoes it, punishment will be in the form of water sprouts, with some plants reacting badly to taking as little as 5 to 10%. I'm looking at you, witch hazel and Daphne. 
On the other hand, some will bounce back just fine if you cut, cut them right to the ground. This is true for many cane growers like hydrangea and forsythia. Here's a tree that was clearly pruned way more than 25 to 30%. Now let's talk about tools. Pruners and loppers are the workhorses in your pruning toolbox. Because they are going to be your go-to tools, I always recommend getting the best quality you can afford. A well-made tool will do a better job for a longer period of time, so you actually save money in the long run by not having to replace them. Plus, a well-made tool is going to do a better job with your pruning. And there are two types of blades for both pruners and loppers. The first is the bypass blade, <clears throat> where the cutting blade bypasses the non-cutting blade, just like the name says. And you can see in this little drawing how the, the, the yellow part is the branch, and the bypass blade comes down and cuts cleanly through the branch and cuts alongside the hook. And this is best for clean cuts on live wood. The other kind of cutting blade is the anvil, where the cutting blade meets the non-cutting blade. And this is best for really hard or dead wood, since it tends to crush rather than cut softer live wood. Small pruners will make clean cuts on branches up to about a half inch in diameter. Anything bigger, you should use loppers, making sure the branch fits entirely within its bite to get a clean cut. Anything too big for the loppers, you should use a pruning saw which is a small, often curved, specialized saw that cuts only on the pull stroke. You can find folding or non-folding pruning saws, and the non-folding kind often come with a scabbard, which is a very good idea since they are very sharp. Safety glasses and hearing protection also are important. Chips and chunks can fly up unexpectedly when pruning, especially when using power tools. Or you can get whacked in the face by a branch you've just snipped off. We've, and any of us that have done any pruning, I'm sure have had that happen. <clears throat> hearing protection if you use power tools. I also recommend a bucket or a tote for carrying everything around while you prune. Um, I also like to use a holster for my hand pruners if I know that's all I'm going to be using. It can be really annoying to set your pruners down while you go empty a trug and then forgetting where you've left them. And I've done that lots of times. You should always disinfect your tools between, plant, between plants, like finish up a plant, and then... <clears throat> You spray, you spray the braid, sorry, spray the blades between plants that you're pruning or on a diseased plant or plant with any evidence of disease at all, you should spray between cuts. So you're not spreading the disease from one branch to another that didn't have the disease on it. A spray bottle with half isopropyl alcohol and half water is an inexpensive, effective disinfectant. It's not a good idea to use bleach, even if it's um, watered down, because it will corrode your tools over time. Now let's talk about the actual process of pruning. There are basically two types of pruning cuts. A heading cut, which shortens branches, trunks, or twigs by shearing, heading back, topping, or tipping. This type of cut changes the growth pattern of the plant by redirecting the plant's resources from upward growth to growth of the lateral buds, usually resulting in an explosion of growth and an increased number of branches. Thinning cuts are those that remove a branch or twig completely back to its point of attachment. <clears throat> First type of heading cut is the one most commonly used by novice pruners and the one most likely to get them into trouble. Non-selective means whacking back a branch to no place in particular. Examples are, as you can see on this picture, these, this little diagram, these branches were just whacked back on the ends. And you see the explosion of growth on the tips of each of those from the whacking back. So examples of non-selective um, cut, heading cuts are shearing, which stimulates bush, bushy regrowth, creating a twiggy outer shell which shades the interior, causing dieback. It's most appropriate for hedges, 
but it's still a very high maintenance uh, uh, way to prune. And it's difficult to keep the plant the same size year after year. You've probably all either had or seen hedges that they get pruned regularly, but they tend to kind of creep bigger and bigger and bigger over time. And, and the, the way the uh, heading shearing pruning is the responsibility for that. Uh, heading back is often used to tidy up a plant and to control size and floppiness. So think about hydrangeas when you prune back your hydrangeas is what you're doing. You're tidying it up and you're, you're um, controlling size and floppiness. The other two um, non-selective uh, heading cuts are topping, and which is usually used to shorten the tree and usually with disastrous long-term results, and tipping, which means small cuts made to stimulate growth in the lateral buds. Think of pitching out your young pepper plants, the tip, the growing tip, or maybe your chrysanthemums. Both of those things will make your plant bushier. You'll get more peppers, if you make your pepper plant bushier, you'll get more flowers on your chrysanthemum if you make it bushier. Many people use non-selective heading cuts in an effort to control the size of a plant, when in reality, the explosion of growth after heading cuts will result in a larger, weaker plant. Here are a couple examples of what happens to a tree that has been topped. To paraphrase Cass Turnbull in her book, Guide to Pruning, Topping causes rot to enter the tree trunk, which shortens the life of the tree, creates dangerous, weakened trunks, and stimulates water sprouts, which are weakly attached and will be prone to breakage. Besides all that, a top tree is ugly. Tree topping has been likened to tree butchery, so please just say no to tree topping. So you can see in these two pictures, the one on the left is looking down onto a tree that was topped, and those five branches that are sticking out from around, those were the, the regrowth, that explosion of growth after the tree was topped. And they looks like they're several years old, but they're all very weakly attached. And they're not going to be, they're not going to withstand wind or any other uh, stressors on the tree. They're going to be break off quite easily. You can also see the, uh, the wood in the center is beginning to rot around the edges. And the picture on the right, I think, is really dramatic. It's a cross section of a tree that was topped. And you can see how the rot has traveled all the way down into the trunk of that tree. Topping a tree is, is um, usually pretty much a death sentence. And it'll be a slow, horrible death for the poor old tree. OK, so here are some examples of bad non-selective heading cuts. The one on the left, you can see where these branches were whacked off and the, all this explosion of growth, these skinny little weak stems, whoosh, the tree is trying to get back to the size it was before because it's missing all those leaves, which it needs to photosynthesize and make food for itself. So it responds with this big explosion of growth. The trees on the right, um, this was, uh, my guess is this was done in some municipality somewhere where people were thinking the trees were too big. Let's cut them all back. Well, every one of those little bare branches is going to have a little puff, a little explosion of growth of weak stems and all these little puff balls of leaves. Very, very uh, unattractive um, way to uh, uh, prune a tree. So let's now talk about uh, selective heading cuts, which are also called it's, a, it's also called a reduction cut because it reduces the length of a branch by cutting off one of two forks of a branch. So if you look at the top of this picture, that was a non-selective heading. Remember, non-selective heading is just whacking a branch off. So you can see the pink and that those pink uh, branches were cut off. And then you can see the growth on the ends of both of those branches that were left and how they're growing up and that there's an explosion. There's a bunch of branches that have grown. Now the reduction cut, the selective heading at the bottom, it took out that whole top branch right back to its point of attachment, left that lower branch, which then the buds on that lower branch were stimulated to grow in a much more natural form. And it's really just a small thinning cut done on the end of a branch. So what happens when you do a, a, re, a reduction cut or a selective heading cut 
is that it redirects the growth based on the location of the remaining buds, usually up and out. So pay close attention to where you make a cut like this. Choose a spot to cut that is just past a bud that is facing the direction you want the new growth to go. So if you want the new growth to go up and out, pick a bud that's facing up and out and make your cut just on the other side of that, okay? <clears throat> Selective heading cuts have little effect on the upward flow of plant resources. So the growth pattern of the plant is mostly unchanged. Now let's take a look at proper versus improper heading cuts. The one on the left is correct. It's got a four, it's about a 45 degree angle. It's a bit above the bud. The angle allows water to run off. So you're not gonna have a problem with rot. So let's look at all the ones that are wrong. The first one, or it's the second one over, but the first wrong one, the cut's in the wrong direction. The water is gonna run into the bud and cause rotting. Uh, the next one, the cut's too close to the bud. That's really um, gonna um, uh, be hard on that bud to have that cut so close to it. And it's really risky. You could be cutting into the bud. The next one's too flat. It, the water can, can pool on the top of that cut, cause rot. The next one, you've left a stub that is going to die and then it's gonna rot and it's gonna be a pathway into the stem for disease or decay. And the last one, the angle is so steep, you have a, a huge wound, which also leaves it more open to uh, decay. Okay, now let's talk about thinning cuts. <clears throat> First of all, a thinning cut removes an entire branch back to its point of attachment, which can be another larger branch, the trunk, or at ground level for cane growers. A thinning cut opens up a plant to airflow, which helps prevent disease, and light, which allows more leaves to photosynthesize and make food for the plant. Thinning cuts do these things while maintaining the natural shape and form of the plant, also keeping it more healthy. Here's a diagram of a couple of plants that have been pruned using thinning cuts, sort of a before and after. You can see on the one on the left that there are dotted lines and then little red slash lines. And the red are where the branches were cut out. The dotted lines are the things that were cut out. So you can see the nice open shape that resulted. Uh, the same on the picture on the right. Uh, that tree is uh, a bit crowded and the leaves on the inside are going to be blocked from the sun. You're gonna have branch dieback, little branch dieback on the interior. Also, it's hard for air to get in. So pruning out and thinning cuts is going to help the health of that tree a lot. Okay. And this illustration, I think, is, is just kind of in a nutshell, the difference between um, heading cuts, uh, particularly uh, the non-selective, just whack it off anywhere kind, and thinning cuts. So you see the, the tree on the left after it's been uh, thinned out. You've got good airflow, you've got good light to get into the tree. And then with the same tree, if they did, if they uh, just whacked everything back indiscriminately, and then you've got all this explosion of growth with these skinny little stems, it first of all is unhealthy for the tree, but it's also very unattractive. <clears throat> so before we talk about the proper way to make a cut, we need a little lesson in the anatomy of a branch. <clears throat> branch wood is different from trunk wood. You can easily see the difference in this cross section of a trunk and branch. Each structure, both the branch and the trunk, lay down a new layer of wood every spring. And where these new layers meet, the trunk wood laminates over the branch wood, creating a wrinkly bulge called the branch collar. So imagine this branch that's sticking in here and the, the, the trunk wood goes like this and kind of crawls around the branch that that bark kind of crawls around the branch in the spring. So the branch collar is trunk wood that is responsible for strengthening the branch for weight bearing and from wind. It is it also has specialized tissue for sealing the wound made by pruning, which is why we are interested in it. The bark on the trunk and the bark on a branch also meet in the crotch forming the bark ridge. And the bark ridge. The bark ridge is almost always easy to see, but the branch collar is sometimes buried within the tree, so will look no different than the rest of the trunk. 
More about that in a minute. Here is a picture of an actual tree with the branch collar and the bark ridges very evident. You can see the wrinkly uh, parts um, below the both branches. They both have a wrinkly part. You can also see the bark ridge. Now let's talk how to make how to make a proper cut. First of all, you cut parallel to the branch collar, but not into it. <clears throat> Don't cut into the branch collar because damaging it is going to impede its ability to swell and completely close the wound, leaving it open to pathogens into the plant. Remember I talked about this marvelous mechanism that plants have for sealing wounds? The branch collar is that mechanism. If, if your branch is cut off properly, that branch collar will swell and close the wound. So here, oh, and don't leave a stub. That's the third thing you have to be careful of. Here are some examples of good wound sealing. The one on the left, you can see where that branch was cut off. That's the black in the center. And then the branch collar is swelling and moving in and closing that wound. And eventually, because this cut was done properly, it will close completely. And the picture on the right has actually several different uh, or, or, uh, cuts in, in different stages of healing. The one on the top left is completely healed. The branch collar has completely closed up. The one down on the bottom is partly closed. And then the one over on the side, it's kind of hard to see, but it looks to me like it's, it's, uh, it's pa partially closed as well. And here are some examples of bad wound sealing. The one on the left here, you can see that the branch collar is valiantly trying to uh, swell and close the wound but the bottom part of that branch collar was cut off when that branch was pruned. And so there's no branch collar there to swell and close. So this wound will never close completely. And then the same on the right, only this time, it was the top of the branch collar that was cut into and damaged. The bottom half is still there. Neither of these is ever going to close completely, leaving that decaying branch wood. Remember, branch wood is different from trunk wood. It's leaving the decaying branch wood open to pathogens and uh, rot. Okay, and here's what happens when you leave a stub. <laughs> I love this picture. This is a very dramatic one. But even if it's a tiny stub, there's still going to be a tiny little branch collar trying its darndest to close around that stub. But it's not going to happen. This branch wood is dead. It's blocking the branch collar from closing the wound. And the decaying branch wood is a perfect pathway for disease to get into the tree. In my experience, when I talk to people about pruning who are, are uh, um, don't really know uh, how to do it or are a little hesitant, I find that uh, people leave stubs because they're afraid to cut too close to the tree, which makes sense. Even if they don't know about the branch collar, they just instinctively don't want to cut too close but you have to cut in the right place because leaving a stub is just as bad as cutting it too close. But what if I can't see the branch collar? Remember that sometimes it looks no different than the rest of the trunk, making it hard to decide where to make the cut. In that case, we look at the bark ridge and we use the angle it forms <clears throat> between the vertical edge of the tree so notice the red line, the red solid line on this drawing, that's where the bark ridge is, okay? And then there's a, a pink dotted line that's the vertical of the tree. Notice angle X in there, that angle that's made between the bark ridge and the vertical. Now we're gonna take that same angle and we're gonna flip it over from the vertical outward on the branch. So those two angles there, are the same. And what that does is that that uh, red dotted line that tells you where to cut. This is uh, so that you won't cut into that hidden branch collar. Okay, cut on the dotted red line. Now, if I'm working on a tree with hidden branch collars and I'm trying to eyeball this angle, sometimes I'll grab a permanent marker and I'll actually make a mark on that branch before I start to cut because sometimes I'll eyeball it and then by the time I get my pruners up there or my saw, it's like, where was that line again? So I find a, a permanent marker is very helpful. 
Have you ever had this happen when pruning a large heavy branch? The weight of the branch pulls down and tears the bark before you can complete the cut. So what you're gonna do is use the three-step method on any branch larger than two inches in diameter to prevent this kind of damage from the bark tearing. So your first cut's gonna be a little undercut, a few inches out from the branch collar. And then your second cut, you're gonna cut most of that branch off to take the weight off of it. And the fact that you have that undercut is gonna prevent that bark from tearing down uh, the branch and into the trunk of the tree. Then your last cut will be just to cut off that stub right at the branch collar. There's not gonna be enough weight there for it to be a problem. You should be able to make that cut just fine. Okay, now let's talk about the steps of pruning, which will be pretty universal across all plant types that need pruning. We start with the four Ds. This means you cut out all the dead and dying. Uh, just a note about dead and dying tissue. On some plants, it's hard to distinguish dead and dying wood from living. So waiting until bud break to prune may be necessary, just so you know what's dead and what isn't. The other one we cut out is diseased. Remember that branch with the black knot on it? You need to get rid of that. Eventually that will take over and kill your tree if you don't. And here's my favorite one, deranged, which is all is what I call branches growing in the wrong direction or those that are way longer than the others, to name a few. You will know them when you see them because they truly are blah, deranged, okay? So here's a couple of pictures to illustrate a couple of them. Here's the black knot that you need to cut this branch at least four inches back from the infection. Remember to um, uh, disinfect your pruners between cuts. Uh, so the disease is usually pretty evident. The picture on the right is a small Japanese maple and I see several what I call deranged branches in here. Um, there's the one going pretty much straight up and to the right that's way taller than everything else, as well as the two at the bottom that are each doing a loop-de-loop. -loop. Those are, I think, are all kind of deranged. <clears throat> Next, you're going to eliminate crossing and rubbing branches. You can see the beginning of wounds in the picture on the left where the branches have been rubbing. These are ideal spots for disease to enter. The picture on the right is of a Japanese maple with a tangle of crossing and rubby brand, rubbing branches that are going to cause problems down the road. This tree is in dire need of renovation pruning. Third, open up the whole plant to light and air using thinning cuts, which we talked about earlier. Fourth, prune for shape using mostly, if not all, thinning cuts. This illustration shows different kinds of cuts but the ones that eliminate those hanging branches are an example of pruning for shape. Pruning for shape can also involve carefully placed heading cuts that leave buds facing the direction you want the plant to grow. Fifth, do not paint the wound with anything. This is opposite of what we were taught in the past, but research has shown that painting the wound just seals in moisture and or pathogens and can lead to rot. Proper cuts will result in the branch collar closing the wound. Here is a large wound that was sealed with some kind of paint. And when the paint was peeled off several years later, instead of sound wood, it was full of decayed wood and fungi that will eventually kill the tree. This was a big giant wound. I, I, I just thought this picture was astounding actually. Cane growers are plants that send up new canes from the ground every year, such as hydrangea, spirea, ninebark, mock orange, forsythia, et cetera. Starting from when they are a few years old, they should have the oldest one to three canes removed right to the ground every year. And when I say right to the ground, I mean as close to the ground as you can get. Leaving stubs is unsightly, will probably send up weak shoots, and is also a pathway for disease. These plants can also be tip pruned or headed back to rein them in if they get too big and floppy. And if they just get too big entirely and you want to start over, some will respond just fine to cutting right to the ground. Given our time limits, this has been a very basic introduction to pruning for aesthetics using methods that maintain the health of the plant. There is much more to learn, especially regarding best practices for specific plants and pruning to control size as well as fruit production. 
Now that you have this basic foundation, however, you will be able to research whatever else you need to know. My rec recommendation for all the beginners out there is Cass Turnbull's Guide to Pruning, an informative, readable, and affordable book that I still refer to often. Another really good one is the Royal Horticulture Society's book on pruning. Good luck and happy pruning. All right, so thank you to Deborah for the explanation part. So we're gonna go into the video field trip. Um, so please don't leave. Even all about pruning is that pruning is wounded, okay? When you prune something, it doesn't heal, it seals, okay? So a tree has natural, tree shrubs plant, they have natural processes that will seal up a wound. And in fact, there are <clears throat> specialized tissue. And in that tissue, there is um, specialized uh, hormones and compounds that uh, inhibit bacteria and pathogens from getting in. Because if you think about cutting off a branch and you've left a wound in the tree, that's an avenue for pathogens, bacteria, fungus, whatever, to get right into the tree. The tree is pretty good at sealing that off, okay, if you do the cut properly. So we're going to learn about that. But the thing about pruning is your best way to do it is to start when the tree, bush, shrub, plant is young, so your cuts are small. Train it from when it's young. And then when the thing, when the uh, plant is big, you're not going to have giant cuts because those, the bigger the cut, the more um, bacteria and pathogens you're going to get in. Okay? Sometimes you can't help that. You've got an old tree you need to rehabilitate. But you can always keep that in your mind. Pruning is wounding. Now, the other thing is the plants themselves, and you have to cut, we need to be pruned. Okay? They can live their lives just happily and fine without being pruned. A branch dies, eventually the plant will shed it or drop off. As people who cultivate plants, we prune for several reasons. Number one, aesthetics. We like the way something looks better. We prune to control size, which is one that kind of bothered me a bit because I think if you think about right plant, right place, you should be planting something in a spot that's not going to get too big for the spot. But we're humans and that's what we do. The third thing we prune for is fruit production. Now, we're not really going to talk about fruit trees today because that's a completely different kind of pruning when you're pruning for fruit production. We're talking today about general pruning basics and trees and shrubs, small trees and shrubs. Now, we're going to talk about tools. Um, there are two kinds of blades on your pruning tools. This particular blade, if you'll notice, it's what's called a bypass. If you watch the, act, the action, the blade bypasses this part, goes right past it when it cuts. See how it does that? Okay, that's called a bypass. These are really good for making nice clean cuts on live wood. And most of what you're going to be doing, you will use a bypass pruner. Now, my big lockers here, this is actually a medium sized locker. This is also a bypass. You have a blade that goes right past. It also does nice clean cuts. Now, this guy, this is called an anvil pruner. And you'll notice the blade on this one comes right down and it meets this solid part. Is that called the anvil? I think that's the anvil, that part. Yeah. So the blade meets the anvil. Now, what this will do on live wood, particularly green woods, it will crush it. So this kind of blade you want to use for dead wood or wood that's really, really hard that can't be crushed, okay? Okay, yeah, so I got this saw for Christmas from my son-in-law and I haven't even used it yet, but it is beautiful. Wow. Isn't that nice? And this is a, a, a saw that is um, specifically for pruning. They cut on the back stroke only. So when you push, nothing happens. It's a pull because you have more power that way and you have more precision. This saw also comes with a couple of blades, which I haven't used, as you can see. There's one that's finer and then there's a finer. But I just bought this for Christmas. I haven't used it yet, so I'm really excited about that. 
very fancy. I know. Very fun. Like, would I have bought that for myself? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. But Christmas present with my son in law. Now, this is a neat little tool that I bought that I have used a couple of times, very specialized. This is a little chainsaw because sometimes your space is so tight you can't get a blade in. But if you can get this guy in and, chow, 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 and it works, it's a neat little thing. I got it from New Valley. I love it. You don't use it very often, but boy, when, that up. when you need it, it's a great little tool. Now, the other thing is when you're pruning, <clears throat> You need to disinfect your tools. The way to to uh, the best way to do that is between every plant, you just spray the blades with with disinfectant. If your plant shows any signs of disease at all, you spray between every cut. Okay, it's like sometimes you'll see black knot. Um, uh, maples, Japanese maples, get this disease where the the branch part of the branch will just turn black. And then it'll kill the end eventually, and you have to cut it back behind that and just get rid of it. Between every cut, you're going to use this. So what is it? This is half isopropyl alcohol, half water. Um, a, bleach, a bleach solution also makes a good disinfectant, except over time it may corrode your tools. This is cheap, and it's really effective, and it won't corrode anything. So I just, every time we move to another plant, we just spray it, okay? The other thing I've learned is that I can keep them all with me as I'm moving through the yard and I don't lay something down and have to run back. It works for really well. So this tool I got for Christmas, and uh, it's a beautiful Felco trimmer, but uh, it's a little bit too big because my hands are small. And I used to have one like Deborah's that's more like, like this size, which I already can feel that that's way more comfortable for me. So when I bought... This one from the garden center, uh, Shauna at Campbell River Garden Center explained to me that, you know, you have the proper amount of leverage with a tool that fits your hand and that you can make a nicer cut. And if you try, and I already noticed the difference with this one, that my cuts aren't as precise as I'm straining to use it. So the idea is to use a tool that fits your hand and to use something with more leverage, like a lopper tool, if you need to cut something that this won't manage. Yeah, that's what I see. The bark ridge right here. So let's say we wanted to cut this branch off. We don't, but if we did, here's the bark ridge like this. And straight down is going to be like this. So we're going to do an angle that replicates this angle. So it's going to be just like this because we don't really see a defined branch collar here. So you're going to take this angle that's going to be the same as the angle from the bark ridge. Okay. This is a little bit hard to see because of the moss. You can see how the collar is already swelling and starting to close in and, and move this in. Okay. This was a big one cut off. So it's going to take yeah. you. See this? This one has closed and healed. Yep. All right, there is a method when you're going to cut a big branch, something with any weight to it. Thanks, Mark. If I were to just go in and start cutting this, I'd get to the point where about here, the weight of this would pull this down and it would rip the bark right down the trunk. So what you do is you do a three stage cut. You start with a little cut here and then you go up here and you cut the whole thing off, it's gone. And now, because you've only got this much left and the weight's gone, then you can do the cut where you need to to take the whole thing off. So any branch that's going to have any kind of weight that might pull itself down, do the three-stage cut. First undercut, that keeps this from ripping. Then cut this off. Then do the last little cut and get the stub off. Right. Uh, it would be unusual, hopefully, that you would be cutting anything this big. You would hopefully have started when the plant was younger and be training it as it goes, and you wouldn't need to cut something that big. But sometimes you, you will, so you have to know how to do that. Part. Suckers, what does that mean, suckers? What does that mean? Anybody know? It's a symptom of stress in the tree. But where are those coming from? Now, there's a reason rootstock is rootstock and not tree stock because the rootstock doesn't make a nice tree. 
So those are going to be the, what they're going to look like the rootstock tree, whatever that was. And we don't want that, but it's, it's, it's not something that's uh, um, aesthetically pleasing. So these should be cut off every time they pop up. What? What kind of, what kind of uh, growth habit is this? Just look at it. You can tell by looking at the new growth coming up from the bottom. Yeah. Canes. What kind of growth habit is this guy? Canes. Canes. It's a cane grower. Yeah, exactly. So does anybody know what the rule is with cane growers? How you prune a cane grower? Okay. The best way to keep a cane grower, number one, from getting all crowded and bunched together and to keep it sort of young and invigorated and blooming like you like, is to take out the largest, oldest one, two, or three canes every spring. Now I would do that on this one after it's bloomed. This one right here, you see how it's rubbing here? Okay, I would take that one. I'm probably gonna need a, maybe even a small chainsaw. Now, here's another thing. If you notice down here, there have been, these have been cut out, but then this one set up a new shoot. Yeah. Then it's probably better when you cut these to go clear to the ground as far as you can. Yeah, I think the problem with that is I couldn't get in there with, exactly. with the saw. Well, and that's where if you start early enough when the plant is young, like the first time you cut out the oldest canes, they may only be about this big. So you don't need to wait until they're giant. What is this one, Richard? Viburnum uh, pink on. There's another one in the front too. I mean, it's, it's gorgeous, but uh, the other thing, <laughs> This one here that's going toward the house, see how it's heading this way and it has been cut here. I would take that one right down to the ground as well, just right off. I have a, a couple of questions. Yes, absolutely. So all these little um, tiny branchlets that are coming off all over the place, I would be inclined and I would think with them impunity to take them all off like all of these little sprouty things coming out the side now but i'd be wrong in doing that? well you can it depends on what you want it to look like the right. thing about the little sprouty things is they're right. going to have leaves otherwise you're going to have to when you think of the most beautiful japanese maples that you've ever seen how would you describe them and what shape what shape are they what do they look like Okay, so I'm seeing this. Spreading. Okay, this one's doing that. What else? Layers. Layers, oh, exactly. Layers. Open layers. Because the most beautiful Japanese maples are the ones that have spaces so that when a breeze blows through, the leaves kind of dance. And when the sun shines on it, you have dappled shade underneath. It's kind of open and light and lovely, okay? Most Japanese maples, once they get into people's yards and get out of nurseries, if they don't know how to prune them, they end up being what I call an umbrella, which is just a solid mass of leaves. Now, two things happen when that happens that I think are undesirable. Number one, you're blocking all the light to the interior of the tree, so everything on the inside is going to die. But number two, the leaves are just this solid mass, and it's just not pretty. It doesn't look like we like Japanese maples to look. So we're gonna prune this today to create layers, all right? Now, the first thing when you're pruning here, with, when you're gonna prune anything, first thing you're gonna do is what I call the four Ds, okay? Dead, diseased, dying, and deranged. <laughs> I just learned that recently and I love it. Okay, so anything dead is really obvious. It's going to be obvious. In fact, on a Japanese maple, it really is obvious because dead stuff is going to be gray. See this piece right here? See how it's gray? That's the whole thing, all the way back to there. And that's the other thing is they're pretty brittle and you can just break it right off. So the first thing you're going to do is take all the dead stuff out. Now that one is partly dead, but the top is alive, so I can't take the whole thing. Okay, so we've cleared out all of the dead stuff, or most of it, the stuff we can just snap off easily with our fingers. 
So now we're going to start looking at shaping this thing. Well, I'm sorry, not shaping. We're going to look at thinning it out. Remember the two kinds of cuts, thinning cuts and heading cuts? A Japanese maple is where you never, ever, ever, ever make a heading cut because you're going to, if you cut this here, you're going to get an explosion that's going to be a little tuft of growth that is totally opposite of the style that we're looking for, of the growth habit we're looking for. So we're going to do all thinning cuts on this, okay? <clears throat> now, this is a fairly good-sized tree, so we're going to take it kind of in zones. And the other thing when you do a maple like this is you think of it as coming uh, from the bottom up, from the inside out is the way we're going to do it. We don't start at the top and work down. We start at the bottom and we work up. So we start by looking for layers. Now, right in here, see how we have a nice space? And we have a space here. We've got some layers already kind of in, in there. But here's a, here's a branch. These two are colliding. See how this one is laying on top of this one? So you need to make a decision. One of those needs to go. So what I do is I visualize, okay, what does it look like without that? What does it look like without that? Which is the better one to cut out of there? So what do you guys think? The second one. This one should yes. go? Yes. Okay, this one fills in the space better. Okay. You guys see that? Everybody yeah, agree? Yeah, yeah, I would go on the other one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. here it looks uh, let me just leave. The other thing when I'm doing something like this, I rarely start with, let's take this whole big branch out to the back. Okay. I start with, okay, these two are in the way of each other. Let's try with the smaller ones first and see which one is going to make more sense. Look at it from another direction. Look at it from another direction. Yes. I will walk around and look at it and think and study it. Okay. But I do have some nice layers already started here. Um, it's crowded here, a little crowded here. This isn't too bad, but I've got this growing toward this. These are kind of growing toward each other. So I have to think about what I'm going to eliminate to make it open and to create those layers that give that lovely shape that we like for a Japanese maple. All right, I will just do some cuts. And then I'm going to be asking your guys' opinion more as we move through this. Okay, so I'm inclined with this one to take this out and to take that out and leave that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if I take this one back to here, and again, I'm looking at the, the branch collar, okay? And, okay, this, this, this takes a while to do this. I see this guy, he's coming across here. I'm gonna take him back right there. I'm gonna leave that one for the moment. Now, I may at some point decide to take this whole thing out like Richard suggested, but I'm going to start with smaller bits of it first. All right, let's look at this one right here. These are all growing together. Now, the other thing is, uh, with the Japanese maple, actually with a lot of things, if you prune back to a bud or a branch that is higher rather than lower and facing out rather than facing in. So I'm looking for branches that are higher and facing out. So here, I have this one sort of underneath. These two are, are going to be, especially when they have leaves on them, this is going to be a mass here. So I could take that out. And follow it all the way. Right follow back. it all the way back to its point of attachment. And then, then I have space in here. Okay, like that. Uh, this one is, okay, so I start slowly. Now look at this, I've got, here I've got a layer, here's a branch, here's a branch, here's a branch right here. First thing I'm going to take is that one. And 
This one, see how this one's kind of coming up? This one right here. I like that better than this one that's pointing straight down. So I'm going to take that down one out. Okay, now that, you know, I'm just opening up got some jet stuff here. Now let's look over here. I have these two, one laying right on top of the other. This one that's kind of coming this way, I like because it's not heading to this branch. So the one underneath is the one I'm going to take out. Okay. Now here's here's one that I would, uh, you know what, I'm going to look for one that's uh, the deranged. See this one right here that's growing back toward the center? That comes under the heading of deranged. It's growing the entire wrong direction. <laughs> so that one needs to come out. Okay, Richard's done a really good job through the years of keeping this part all open in here. See, the other thing about a properly pruned Japanese maple is, is you're, you're going to open up to the lovely trunk and branch structure. Even in the summer when it's leafed out, you'll still be able to see all the lovely branches and the trunk. This has a really lovely shape. Um, remember, what's the first? What's the first one of the four Bs? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Japanese ma Japanese maples are so cooperative when it comes to that. Can I walk in? Yeah. Because what what the dead stuff is is it all turns kind of white and gray. So it's really easy to see, and you can just look it off like this. But if you get all the dead stuff out, this whole branch here is dead. Get all the dead stuff out and see what you're left with. But see how these are dead on the inside? Because the lights are blocked to them. Leaf buds to the opposite of each other. Well, and not even just leaf buds, but also branches. Like, Whatever. yeah. Like, there's one that's going inward. Yeah. See how this branch right here is coming in? Yes, that one. And, oh. and, it, and it, But it's coming in, so I want to get rid of it. That's one of my deranged ones. I, I totally see that. But when you're talking about well, buds. I'm not talking about with tiny buds. I'm talking about oh, you're talking something. Okay. something um, let me see if I can find an example. Yes. Okay. Um, um. Yeah, so this is all really crowded in here, but I'd like it to be up higher so I can leave this. So I'm going to take some of these lower ones out. Or that one. And so basically what you're doing is you're pruning for direction. Yeah, oh, and layer and, and layers. And layers, yes. All right. So see all these all the branches that are crowding in here. Here's a nice one that's up. See this one's up and out. So this one is coming this way and kind of starting to point yeah. down. So that one should come out. See how it's pointing down? It's pointing down. Would you say cut it right, right back there. to the point of the top here? Yes. Okay. Then I've got a space in here. I'm, yes. I'm trying to create space for the leaves. Okay, mm -hmm. is that better? Yes. Now look at this one. This is is up, so I have to decide, am I gonna leave this and take this out? Okay, if I took that out, what do you think? I think that would be a better idea. This is more structural. 
where that's just a secondary branch. So if you had to yeah. take this out, you'd have to take it all well, essentially. Don't worry about that, no, it's, it's too much. It, it yeah. would be too much. Yeah. So let's take this one. That one is, it's coming right up underneath and crowding. Now I may end up taking both of these. I don't know yet, but I'm always more inclined to take part of it first and then look at it. Mm -hmm. Can't put it back once you've taken it off. Oops. Okay. Oh, the one that's great. Like this one's rubbing on. This one? Yeah. Yep. That one? Yep. Good eye. Was okay, also so one you, you look at this study and, and tell me which branches should come out. The one right there, uh, it's crossing over a main branch. So this so one. That, that was a tip. So we're basically trying to uh, fix them. Right. When it's been a tip prune, then you're going to have issues like this, which is another reason not to do tip pruning. One thing about this particular tree is very weak. Like if you even walk into it, the branches break off. Yeah. And before I had the snow guards put on the house, the snow would actually uh, slide off. And if yeah. you could see, there's been a fair amount of damage down right there, there yeah. from it. So look at this one that's growing right directly into the house. Instead of just cutting off the end, go all the way back. And you can actually take that other one off too because it's crossing over. No. This one? Yeah. Yeah. I was just trying. I couldn't get my blade in Do you want me to do it from this end? There I am. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so what else do you see? So the one that's right in front of you, there's a weird curve. Is that this one? Yeah. 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 See, that's yeah. one of the great oh. ones. Oh, and it's growing toward the house anyway. See, this had a this was cut off here. There's a little peg left. So yeah, I would take that out. So the other thing about the other thing I would do, all of these little branches down low, eliminate all of those or most of them because Japanese maples have a really lovely trunk and branch structure, and you can really see it so much better if you get rid of. This stuff. Deborah, are you ready for some questions? Yes, I am. There's a lot. Okay. Uh, we had a few that were about the um, spraying your blades in between cuts or in between trees. Uh, mm -hmm. One was about what strength of rub rubbing alcohol? Um, just the kind you buy in the drugstore. I'm not sure what that is. I, yeah, just sort of, it. so it's not, it's not like pickling vinegar where you need the higher percentage, no. just not that picky. No. Okay. No, just drugstore, red drugstore, isopropyl, rubbing alcohol. Yeah. Great. And then the next one, um, what was about needing to wipe the blades with a cloth do you do you just spritz them or do you use a cloth at all or how, how do you um i i don't wipe them uh the alcohol evaporates quite quickly and actually the water does too i when i'm all done with my pruning and i spray them one last time i hang my pruners up on a hook in my garden shed with the with the blades open to let them dry i mean you could wipe them if you a rag if you want but i I've, I've never done that so yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, what are water sprouts or water shoots? I think is the other name for those. Okay. Water sprouts is the, is a plant's response to being over pruned. <clears throat> when you take off too much of the foliage and the branches, the, the plant is responding desperately trying to put all that back because it needs all of the leaves to photosynthesize and feed itself. So it responds by uh, all of the, the um, buds just, wah, and they all grow. 
and they are skinny and there's like a lot of them. And if they're on a, like, say you've got a branch that's kind of horizontal this way and you've tip pruned the end of it or headed the end of it off, then all those little buds along there are all gonna shoot straight up. Those are water sprouts. And it's a response to over pruning. So um, yeah, that's another reason for staying within the pruning budget. Then the, the tree won't respond in desperation to replace what you've taken out. And the buds you're talking about, they're just those little novels that are like possible branches. Is that yeah. what that means? The, 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 the one, that, yes, the latent buds that haven't actually swelled and started to grow yet. But when you do a heading cut and you cut the end off, see most of the resources go toward the end or out toward the end of a branch. You cut that off. There's also apical dominance, which there's a hormone secreted by that tip. And you cut that tip off then all the resources, instead of going straight up to the end, they go out like this to all of those side buds and buds growing straight up, a whole bunch of them in a row, that's water sprouts and they, they look really bad and they're weak and yeah, not good. So there's two types of buds is what I'm understanding. There's flower buds and then there's these tree buds that we've been talking about. Oh yeah, yeah, flower buds are, a. Um, a whole different thing. And depending on the plant, they can be part of that latent bud on the stem that has leaves as well. Uh, it depends on where the plant forms its buds for flowers. But when, I, when I'm talking about these, I'm talking about buds that turn into branches. That's what water sprouts are. Great. Okay, one last one about water sprouts. Are water sprouts and suckers the same thing? Suckers usually are coming from the rootstock uh, underground. And it, they can, it can happen for um, a number of reasons. Usually it's thought of as being a, uh, the plants under some kind of stress and over pruning can be an, a stress. The plant is desperately trying to put out more leaves to feed itself. So it will send shoots out on all the branches that were pruned, but it'll also send shoots out from the rootstock. Sometimes the rootstock is just very vigorous and it just gets all like wants to take over and it'll send out suckers. Generally, you just, just whack them off because they're no good. Okay, related, if you've topped or over pruned a tree and now realize this was not a good idea, is there a way to eventually salvage what damage you may have done? Uh, depending on how much and how badly and how long ago, yes, renovation pruning is is a is a thing. Uh, it's um, usually will take several years. You can't do it all at once. You can't do it all in one year. It'll take several years to sort of get the plant back. Uh, I would recommend. Um, Cass Turnbull has a good section in her book, Guide to Pruning on Renovation Pruning. Uh, the Royal Horticultural Society also talks about renovation pruning, but it's going to be different for every plant depending on its growth habit and, and how it was malpruned, what exactly was done. Topping is the hardest thing to come back from because you've just whacked the top and opened a big wound that really is going to have a hard time healing. So, I'm sorry if you feel bad about your, your pruned tree, Jessica. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, related question, how would you go about pruning a tree that has been neglected for years without doing any long-term damage? Uh, well, again, that comes under, it's a different kind of renovation pruning, one that's been neglected. And, and it's not something you're going to do all in one year because it, to take out everything that's all crowded and everything in there, is going to cause water sprouts. It's gonna cause that explosion of growth as the tree tries to replace it. So start first with getting all the dead stuff out, then you can see what you really have. And then you just kind of have to make a plan. What are the most important things to get out of there first? The first year you may only do crossing and rubbing and derange the, the crazy ones that are going, you know, you may not do any more than that if there's a lot of crossing and rubbing and deranged. But it's again, it's going to be, two, three, four years before you have it actually in the shape that it needs to be. You, that's the main thing, you can't do it all at once. And Deborah, can you remind us what the maximum amount of the plant that should be pruned at a time is? Well, it, if you think around 25 to 
that'll hold true for most plants. Uh, I again, there are exceptions. Some are really picky. I'm I've heard that um, Daphne's. If you prune a Daphne even a little bit, it kind of sulks for a while. Uh, witch hazel don't like to be pruned. Uh, sometimes cherries don't like to be pruned. On the other hand, some cane growers, you can cut them right to the ground and they'll come back just fine. So it depends on the plant. But if you start with the whole 25% idea, see how the plant responds. And then you have an idea if you can do more or less. Okay. Um, so somebody has a related question about sometimes maybe leaving the water sprouts um, in case it brings that ratio up too high for the plant. Yes, in fact, the best, if, if your tree is really covered with water sprouts, you can't go in and just take them all out the first year because it will just make more. The, it, the tree is responding again, it's trying to replace tissue that is lost. So the, the best thing to do the first year is take out every third of the weakest ones and leave the others. And then the next year, take out half and leave the other ones. So you're gonna to have to kind of make some decisions about which ones are going to sort of ultimately be left, but don't take them all out at once because you're gonna go over your pruning budget and the tree is gonna respond by making more. Great. Uh, isn't topping the same as pollarding? Uh, pollarding is, is a, um, how to describe pollarding? New growth is cut off as it comes out and, and it's done in very formal gardens. It's used more like in, in the UK than it is here. Formal, they want the tree to remain a certain size and a certain shape. So new growth comes out and they just, they just cut all this new growth off and they keep cutting it off. It's a, it's a very particular way of pruning a tree to keep it a certain size and shape. And it's, it's a lot of work and fussy. So yeah, look, look it up in one of the pruning books and you'll, you'll see what it looks like and, and how to do it and probably decide not to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can I prune my Japanese maples right now? I'm on Vancouver Island. You, you can actually. We're, we're coming, uh, well, right now I'm in Cumberland and we've got uh, six inches of snow on the ground. So um, things are not uh, coming out of dormancy yet. It's going to be a little while before there's bud break because we're having a, a pretty cold uh, late winter. You can actually prune them pretty much anytime. It's good to prune them this time of year because you can really see the branch structure and you know what it is you're taking out and what you want to take out. There's, there's, uh, you can read about concern with Japanese maples that if you prune them too late, they will bleed. And really all that is, is just the sap running. And it looks awful and it's really kind of scary, but it doesn't really hurt the tree at all. I mean, it's like, think about uh, a sugar maple. We, we drain the sap off of those all the time and they do just fine. Um, but yeah, you can definitely, you know, prune right until, you know, the leaves are starting to come out and obscure what you're doing. And then sometimes during the, the year, like during the summer, I'll walk by my Japanese maple and I'll go, that that spot right there looks really crowded and I'll see there's one branch and one little branch and I'll just take it out so you can you can kind of prune anytime just don't go overboard <laughs> okay so is that specific to Japanese maples pruning anytime or is that just general no pretty much anything there there are some things that uh like like for instance stone fruits uh cherries plums apricots things like that they should be pruned in August or September because they are so prone to funguses that if you prune them in late winter and then you've got a cool wet spring, that's perfect conditions for fungus to just move right in. But if you prune them in August or September when it's warm and dry, the wound has a time has time to kind of dry and, and close a bit and then the funguses don't move in. So every, every plant is going to have a best time of year to pruning. Again, that 13 pruning groups from the Royal, Royal Horticultural Society, the, that's gonna be really helpful. So just, just look up pruning groups and, um, or if you have a good reference book about plants, it will uh, often, they will tell you what pruning group your plants are in. Even just knowing it's called a pruning group is very helpful. 
Yeah. Yeah. And there are 13 of them and each of them are different. They're for different bloom times and different shapes and, you know, yeah, it's, it is helpful. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, here's a different kind of different uh, flavored one. We bought a house with several large trees that were planted very close together. I don't like to cut down trees, but if the trees are touching and growing into each other, what else can I do? Any advice? Well, it depends on what kind of trees they are. Um, if you're worried that, that, oh gosh, you know, if you're really concerned that they're going to be dangerous because they're growing into each other, I would get a certified arborist out there to have a look and um, make sure this isn't just, you know, your local tree guy or, you know, the company that goes out and says we do landscaping and we cut down trees, get an arborist, a certified arborist, because they, they are uh, educated in, in uh, trees and the way they grow. And they'll be able to assess whether this is dangerous, whether it's okay, whether you should take one out, leave the other. Uh, without looking, I, I couldn't hazard a guess, but you need a professional to look at it if you're worried. Um, okay, so we have a bunch of questions about grapes and pear trees and fig trees and all the fruit things. And we were talking a little bit before this session started and you were saying that fruit pruning is quite different than ornamental pruning. It is, it is. Uh, because you, you need to know the particular plant that you have that's gonna bear fruit. You need to know uh, what part of the plant does it bear fruit? Where does it bloom? Uh, there, there's all kinds of things to know. Like an apple blooms on little spurs. It doesn't bloom out on the new growth from last year. It, grew, it blooms and bears fruit on little spurs. A peach tree blooms, the, the flowers come right out on the branches. They don't have the little spurs like apples do and pears do. Um, I would recommend um, uh, the, the, a book on pruning that talks about specific plants. And there are lots of them out there. That Royal, Royal Horticultural, I cannot say that word. Horticultural. Book. Yes, Horticultural, thank you. It actually, talk, it actually goes through plant by plant. This is how you prune this plant. This is what you do. Um, figs have a particular way to prune them. Uh, everything has, in order for uh, best fruit production and the health of the tree. So there's no sort of, this is how you do it for all of them. Um, what I tried to show you tonight was how to make proper cuts, uh, the different kinds of pruning cuts, that sort of thing, so that you're armed with that knowledge when you go look up, say, how to prune an apple tree or how to prune a fig tree. We just didn't have time for that. So yeah, this is this is awesome. Um, and obviously people have a lot of questions and will know to have other sessions about different kinds of pruning for sure. Um, so there's a few questions that are again a subset of fruit trees, but I think they're probably part of a greater pruning problem where they send out way too many shoots, but is that because of improper pruning to start with or a different problem? Uh, what what kind of a tree were you talking about or plant? I didn't um, catch that. this one's a fruit a fruit tree and somebody had a pear tree that they were frustrated with a bunch of shoots. Well, again, if they're water sprouts, that that's a response to over pruning of some kind. You know, the other thing I find a lot of times with a fruit tree is people people want them they don't want them to be as big as they are because they can't get the fruit that's up at the top. So, and there, there, there is a way to prune a fruit tree so that it, it's called an open crown so that it kind of does this rather than this. Um, there is a way to do that. But again, you need to find a book that walks you through that. And that Royal Horticultural Society book is really good. It's got lots of pictures. It's, it's um, diagrams. It's very, very helpful for how to prune individual like fruit trees and things. Now I will say one thing about things that are cane growers, raspberries, um, blueberries are a cane grower. Treat those just like any, but blueberries are like a cane grower. Every few years you need to take out one or two of the oldest, biggest canes. That's gonna feel like, ah, but that's my big. Okay, you're revitalizing the plant when you do that because it sends up new canes from the ground every year. So get rid of the old ones that before they get too tired and die anyway. Uh, raspberries, 
uh, cut back the dead ones from last year that bore berries, thin out the ones that are left. I like to cut them back to about five, six feet tall, because if you let them grow nine or 10 feet, how are you gonna, you know, then they're gonna bend over and then how are you gonna pick them? If you cut them back, all those side shoots will grow and you'll have lots of berries on them anyway, so yeah. Great. Uh, do you consider moss or fungus growth disease and sh should it be removed with pruning? Um, I think you're probably thinking of moss and lichens, uh, not Actually, fungus. Maybe. Yeah, I, I, I suspect that's what you're thinking of. And in, in this part of the world, we have a lot of trees with lichens on them and they're not harmful to the trees at all. So don't worry about those and neither is moss. Uh, fungus is, a, is an organism, organism that moves in to um, infect uh, the wood, the plant, the tree, the whatever, and it is what uh, leads to decay. In fact, here's an interesting fact. Um, trees evolved long before funguses did. And all the trees that died and fell, uh, there were no funguses to come in and make them decay. So they just piled up and they piled up and they piled up and all that pressure pushing down, that's where we got coal. There weren't any funguses to, to uh, um, make the wood decay and decompose. So uh, yeah, funguses are not good, but lichens are fine. Lichens and moss are fine. They're not gonna hurt your trees. Great. Uh... Okay, I'm typing an answer about the Royal Horticultural Society pruning book. If you search for Royal Horticultural Society and pruning in the library catalog, probably tomorrow it'll be in there because I just put it in this afternoon because I got a little behind. Um, oh, somebody has asked again if if um, if you can prune your cherry and apple trees right now. Um, you can prune apples now. In fact, now is the best time. Don't prune your cherries now, though. Stone okay. fruit should be pruned in August, September. Okay, as per the other answer about the wound. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So apples, yeah. Apples and right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then there was another question about soil being used to help wounds heal. Mm, nope. Nope. Just, just good cut and leave it alone. Yep. If the cut is in the proper place, it will seal up and, and uh, it will be fine. Whenever you put anything on there, you run the risk of introducing fun funguses or, or pathogens or bacteria or something that's going to get in and infect that wound and not be a good thing. Eventually no. it will kill the tree. Yeah. How much should you prune back a well-established wisteria? Oh my gosh, wisteria, you know, I don't have personal experience with pruning a wisteria. What I know about wisteria is if you don't prune them, eventually they will crawl into your bedroom window and strangle you in your sleep. So they do need to be cut back because they are very, very vigorous and strong growers. Um, again, I would look that up in one of those pruning books. I, I've never had a wisteria, so I've never actually pruned one. So Now I'm worried for this person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you know, they have been known to get so big and so heavy that they will pull down like a pergola that they're growing on or some kind of a structure, uh, uh, a roofed over uh, porch even. They will grow up on there and just collapse it because they get so big and so, so heavy. And they're, they're very vigorous and they're, they're hard to kill. I do know that once they're established. <laughs> or else they'll come and kill you okay <laughs> how would you correctly prune the tree that had the stub when you came across it oh just just a, a, the same way you would as if that stub was a live branch just identify the branch collar and just cut that stub off right outside the branch collar and then the branch collar can close and uh, heal it yeah okay great in fact go out to your garden tomorrow and cut off all those stubs that you left from pruning before. <laughs> You're being careful and trying to be kind. Yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> okay, somebody has a 10-foot cedar bush that is bonsai 
to grow? Um, how do they get it to grow again or grow new branches? It's been so, it sounds like it's been very, very trained and they'd like it to be a bit more natural. Oh, a bon it's been bonsai and they want to let it get big? Is I think that, so. Is okay. Well, the thing about bonsai is you're you're always pruning the roots and the top both to, to keep growth way under control. So the way to, to let it go is, first of all, probably get it out of the pot that it's in, put it either in a bigger pot or put it in the regular ground. It's 10 feet tall it, already. 10 feet? Yeah. Yeah, you probably, if you, oh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd probably have to see it, but my inclination would be to get it out of the pot and put it in the ground and let it um, let it kind of do its thing. And as, as it's established and it establishes more root system, then you can start looking at shaping the top the way you want. Yeah, bon so bonsai is something I is don't that have tree I'm just thinking that they're like, I have a neighbor on our street and they like to trim their trees incessantly and they look kind of bonsai-ish if they've been like, instead of, truly bonsai, but like kind of over trimmed, you would just leave it? Well, you need, you need to have something to work with. Anything that's been over trimmed, like I, like the lollipopping, you know, the, the big, yeah. the round sort of, you need to just let that go for a while and then um, get into the inside and start doing some thinning cuts to open it up to light and air because the inside's probably all dead. It's, this is going to be renovation. It's going to take several years to get it back to its um, normal growth habit. Okay, yeah. so that renovation pruning patch phrase, that's what to look for. Yep. Uh, any tips on espalier pruning? We have a few questions about espalier and grafted. Oh, espalier uh, is, uh, is something you have to kind of be on top of like several times a year. You have to get in there and you have to pinch off or knock off the little buds that are growing in the direction you don't want them. Fruit, espalier fruit, um, remember that apples, apples, for instance, um, they fruit on the spurs. So don't go in and knock the little spurs off. Okay, you're gonna you're gonna need to go and study, read about apple trees and the way they grow. The 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 new growth is just vegetative. It'll just have buds on it. Last year's growth is gonna create spurs where the where the actual flowers and fruit are. And then the year before that, two years ago, the spurs there just keep getting a little bigger. So they'll have more and more fruit on them. So with an espalier tree, you, you need to, um, I, I, what I do know is you, you, you prune it several times a year. You're kind of on it all the time. There are, there are a lot of work to keep that shape so that they don't revert back to the growth habit that they are uh, genetically disposed to because no tree is genetically espalier. That shape is just not natural. So um, I think that that uh, Royal Horticultural book, again, has a whole big section on espalier and how to do that. So. Okay. And and um, how about grafted ones? I'm, I'm, it sounded like maybe it was one of those like fruit trees that has like six different types of apple on it. Well, you're you're going to prune those the same as you would any apple, just being careful that not to take out one whole branch that's one whole type of apple. Like I have an apple tree in my yard that's that that was five varieties. Last winter, the snow the deep snow that we had broke one of them off. So one of my varieties is just gone. It was just, the snow just broke it. Um, but the other four are still there. So you just you just prune like you would any other apple tree, just being careful not to take any one variety completely out, unless you don't like it. If you don't like it, just, you know, <laughs> right back to the trunk. <laughs> Very custom. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, this one's a bit different. How to prune a monkey puzzle tree? I have no idea. And my guess is, okay, first of all, why do you want to prune that tree? Is it, if it's getting too big, oh dear. Yeah, I don't know how to prune a monkey puzzle tree. They don't look good pruned, do they? Well, they're already sort of an open kind of a shape anyway. So I'm not sure if you're pruning for size, I I think... I'm not sure how they take to pruning. I mean, they're a tree that is not native to our area. They're 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 a really odd tree. Um, 
There's a ton of them in Nanaimo for some reason. Yeah. Well, I know they get big too. So I think sometimes people don't realize that and they get planted someplace and then they get too big. And then people are like, what do I, what do I do? I need to, I need to control the size. Well, again, right plant, right place. It was planted somewhere where it, you know, getting big is not going to be appropriate. So yeah. More of our cedars. Um, okay. Um, with Carrie japonica, some branches got pushed over from the snow. Should I cut at the base or back to an upright side branch? Uh, the base of the whole plant or an upright? I think so. Um, well, I, I, I'm having a little trouble visualizing what you mean, but if you've had something that got pushed over by the snow and it looks like it's broken even, cut that right off just behind the break so it's nice and clean. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly. Just, I'm just Googling this carry japonica. Oh, it's got those, it's that one with the yellow bunchy flowers. It's a cane grower. Yeah, Richard. Okay, it's a cane grower. Yeah, yeah. It just, just anything, any of the canes that got bent over and won't stand back up, just whack them off at the ground. Cane growers are really tough, most of them. They're, they're hard to kill. I mean, if you wanted to kill a forsythia and you cut it right to the ground, it would just come back. They, they, they're just tough. They're, all the buds for new branches are down underground and they just come back. So yeah, just cut off the ones that are bent over that you don't, uh, that uh, won't stand back up again. Okay, excellent. So that's, a nice one. Oh, um, if I can't find pruning info based on our area, which country is similar? For example, if I find information based out of England, can I follow those pruning times? Is our weather similar throughout the year, I guess, to England? <laughs> uh, actually, the weather in the UK is very similar to our, to our climate here. Um, and I'm pretty aware of this. I have a daughter who lives in England, and their weather is always very much like ours. It's temperate. It's got influence from the ocean. It doesn't get really, really cold, except now that we have climate change. Occasionally, they'll have a deep cold. Occasionally, they'll have it really hot. Their, their weather is very similar. So yeah, that's a, the only issue you're going to find is that some of the plants are quite different and you won't have seen them. And some of the plants we have won't be in their literature, but the climates are very much the same. Yes. That's great to know. Uh, we are at the end of our time, so uh, we pruning grapes. You said before was complicated. Well, there are thirteen of its them. own. <laughs> yeah, there there are thirteen of them, and if you um, if you if you look up a plant, I mean, you know, ask Mister Google about a plant. Uh, say, let's say you want to know what pruning group uh, Daphne Odora is in. Daphne Odora pruning group, just Google it and see what comes up because it most pretty much all woody and uh, perennial type of things, trees, et cetera, have been assigned to a pruning group. And then you can look up the pruning group and see what it says. It'll tell you how to prune, when's the best time, um, there are three things I can't remember the other one, but it'll give you the information you need. Perhaps that would be something that we could deal with in the future on pruning fruit trees. Uh, I've noticed people uh, have uh, fruit trees, uh, espalier trees and everything else like that. So that's something that we can look forward to and maybe uh, do a presentation on it in the future. Yeah. That would be yeah. fantastic. That was just too big to include tonight. That was just way too totally. I mean, pruning is just a huge topic. So, you know, I figure if I give everybody sort of the basics on proper cuts, you know, that sort of thing, at least they won't be going out there whacking off the branch collars and leaving stubs and topping their trees and that kind of thing. So, yeah. yeah. Well, folks, we have answered 40 of your questions. There are 28 left, but we're going to, uh, we'll send out the, um, catalog links for some of those pruning books that Deborah has been recommending. So you can find those.